Today we're going to talk about digital forensics and instant response fundamentals. My name is Chris Dobin, CTO and co-founder of Kato Security. And hi, uh, Ollie Smith. I'm the COO at Kato. Hi, I'm Al Cochrane. I'm uh, lead solution engineer at Kato. Cool. So starting from the, the ground up with dictionary definitions, uh, Ollie, what is forensics to you? To me, okay, well, that's, yeah. it's an interesting one. So, so we, we could look at kind of dictionary definitions and things, but I kind of look at it in a relatively simplistic form, which is number one, it's about um, being able to look at things in a way that allow you to see kind of below the surface and, and see things that you wouldn't normally be able to see uh, without using certain specialist techniques. And it's also about doing it in such a way that um, it, it should be repeatable to an extent uh, that you can achieve the same results when you, uh, when you repeat that process. Why does it have to be repeatable? Well, um, well, we'll come on to some of the, 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 the points around um, process a bit later, but this is really about um, if it were going into a, a formal process, uh, court, tribunal, something like that, um, there's going to be another side, another party to whatever uh, the process is, um, and they're going to want to be able to, to, to be comfortable that um, what you're presenting is true and accurate and a representation of the, of the original. So that's why it's good to be repeatable. Thank you. I think on the next one. Uh, so this one, not what it means to you, but what is evidence? Well, I mean, evidence can mean all sorts of uh, all sorts of different things. But you know, broadly speaking, in the context of what I was just saying around a, a formal process, um, it is the the results or the output of um, whatever forensic process in this context that you've been through um, that can be presented in a way that uh, will stand up to the scrutiny of, of a court of law and an evidential process. So. Yeah, I mean, that's where it comes from, right? For us, because we do a cloud container, it ends up being disk images and, you know, big archives of containers, but it's, um, that's the root of it. So on to the, the next ones we get through. Uh, and then I guess you can really phrase it too, is what's the difference between volatile data and persistent data? So, I mean, volatile data, uh, taking that one first, is, you know, really data that is, is, is kind of transient by nature, right? So it's, it's short-lived. It's not going to exist um, indefinitely. Whereas persistent data, an example, uh, being data that might be on a hard disk uh, or something like that, it's uh, essentially, it, it lives beyond a short period of time. Volatile data, a good example is things like memory. Um, so it's, uh, it only lives for the, for the amount of time that it's, that it's needed. Nice. No prep on these answers, by the way. We just grabbed Ollie as he was walking past, poor guy. Uh, on to the next one, we're kind of getting through building up. I guess we kind of covered this already, haven't we? Disk forensics, memory forensics, I mean, network forensics. Well, I mean, it's kind of, it, it's kind of, um, Al may or may not be coming on to the kind of OSI model and kind of um, the various different layers of, uh, of, of, of network uh, data transit, but network forensics is essentially looking at um, in its simplest form, um, uh, packet transfer, so PCAPs uh, and, uh, and NetFlow data that's that's tr transiting a network and being able to capture that in a way that allows you to piece it back together and figure out what's what's going on. Yeah. I mean, that ends up being used a lot more, I guess, in instant response than yeah, traditional definitely. Yeah, forensics kind of stuff. Cool. On to the next one. Kind of getting to the end of the fundamentals. Chain of custody, everyone's favorite forensics topic. Well, indeed, yeah, and it's everyone's favourite because when you get this stuff wrong, uh, that's mm. one of the the, the the first things that can cause a case, if it is going through a criminal process, uh, can cause a case to be thrown out. Um, chain of custody in its simplest form is essentially being able to prove that the evidence is, um, that you know uh, where the evidence has been uh, uh, in its entire uh, evidential life. So from the moment it was first it first became evidence, so it's captured as a, as a forensic image, for example, to the moment that it's exhibited as part of a witness statement and then presented into a, into a court. You can speak to uh, and prove the location um, at all times, and critically, you can prove the access at all times. So has um, you know, which individuals have, have accessed it, be that forensic investigators, examiners, um, the police, you know, whoever it may be. Um, and in accessing that evidence throughout the, uh, the, 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 its evidential life, um, can you demonstrate that it's not been changed, right? So the evidence is no more now and no less now than it was when it was first created, essentially. And the picture on the slide is a chain of custody form. Well, so, so a lot of people focus on chain of custody as the, as the form itself, and chain of custody form is just one aspect of, of chain of custody. That is usually the mechanism that people track 
um, the, the chain of custody evidence, but it's, it's only a, a small part of the process, right? Actually um, using um, credible um, technology throughout the, the process, using things like if you're, if you're imaging uh, computer disks, uh, using write blockers, using hashing mechanisms, MD5, all that sort of stuff uh, along the way that allows you to prove that it is still, um, it hasn't changed. Those are also part of the, the overall um, evidential process and the evidential integrity uh, component of it. Nice. Thank you. Um, I think we're getting into kind of some different sections now. Yeah, I'll skip the product logs. It basically, we do a bunch of chain of custody in the cloud, which is unique. Um, check out the link at the end for more. Uh, on to the next bit. And I think finally, is this over to you, Al? To kind of, I was going to ask you just, I mean, what models are there for kind of DFIR in general? I know there's a ton of them. And, you know, I guess how do the processes break down when you're doing a digital forensic and um, incident response? Yeah, certainly uh, there are quite a few different models that are out there. Uh, to name a few, uh, is like NIST uh, and SANS uh, for the incident handling kind of process. Uh, this model that we see on the screen here is uh, more akin to the more digital forensics. Uh, aspects and uh, not necessarily just for instant response, but you follow the same kind of process and procedures as always talked about to generate that evidence that you want to do the examination on. Yeah, I mean, I looked at a bunch of these models too when we were all making the slides, and there's obviously a lot of overlap between them, but there's some differences too. And I guess fundamentally, just helps you work out what to do next, right? Yeah. Cool. On to the next one, please. I apologize in advance the wall of text over the uh, the next couple of slides, but I mean, Al, how would you recommend, and Ollie, maybe you'll pipe into, how would you recommend people prepare for instant response? Like what kind of instant response planning should people be doing? Yeah, definitely. I, as, as with all of the uh, kind of incident handling processes, preparation is probably the, the most key aspect, never mind you know, the following kind of steps. If you're not ready uh, to actually deal with the types of incidents that you're going to be posed with, um, then you know, you're going to be trying to do this by the seat of your pants, uh, to coin a phrase. So you know, understanding exactly you know, what scenarios will you or won't you deal with uh, ransomware um, kind of victims, when would you need to reach out to the regulatory authorities? That way you're not having to scrabble around trying to figure out that while you're in the midst, midst of the, the kind of firefighting uh, of an incident. Should you pay the ransom? <laughs> it's really down to the organization uh, you know, kind of based on it. Yeah, sorry, very off topic, but it's always a controversial one. Um, on to the next one, let's, yeah, I'll jump to the next one, we can, we can kind of get through. Um, so yeah, I mean, the next step is obviously pulling together the instant response team. It might be a permanent team or it might be something you assemble at the time. But Al, I mean, you've done a lot of experiences of flying in, you know, and, and helping people do this. Do you have any, any kind of tips? Yeah, definitely. So um, I think one of the key points here is that an incident response team doesn't always need to be technically focused. Um, you know, there's the kind of leadership role, uh, which will uh, interact with like major or key stakeholders uh, and translating some of the information that's come out of the technical investigations. But there's also the elements here of like documentation and crisis management uh, kind of covers a lot of that type of information as well. And that's key. So um, if Again, kind of going down that um, aspect of if law enforcement gets involved, then you're able to uh, hand over case notes uh, and document exactly what you've done, when you've done it and why you've done it, uh, in case you also have to make a, a kind of report back to regulatory bodies as well. Yes. We always have a good notebook of any cases you're working on. That's right, the contemporaneous notes. Yeah, famous now. Um, cool, and in terms of actually running investigation, I mean, there's just so much here, right? I, I, it was kind of hard to put in a single slide, but um, yeah, I mean, Al, do you have any comments in terms of how you actually run an investigation, if you can, or is it something to break out later? Um, yeah, I mean, just to cover off the high level, um, first and foremost is to really understand the scope of your investigation. Uh, you may be seeing a uh, kind of output of the um, an incident just in a single host or uh, in a single set of logs. However, 
when you investigate that further, you may determine that it's, yeah, it's not just one machine uh, or one user's credentials. It's a, a, a lot much larger problem uh, than what you think. If you just deal with that singular entity by itself uh, and haven't fully investigated it properly, then inevitably that problem is going to come back and bite you uh, in the backside later on. Have you seen that happen before? Uh, more than once. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. But, um, cool. All right. Then we get into the end of the section. On to the next slide, please. All right. Then everyone's favorite topic um, and hard to get right. How about containment remediation? I mean, any tips in terms of how you, you actually you know, plan and execute a proper containment remediation? Yeah, and, and this kind of goes back into that preparation aspect. So, you know, um, making sure that uh, you have got access to enable um, hard uh, kind of blocks or, you know, shutting down machines or shutting down network segments. You have the authority then and there to be able to do that, maybe to contain a ransomware style operation from preventing it to um, go across the rest of your network. All the way through to, well, okay, if you're maybe investigating uh, an APT style uh, a kind of breach or uh, incident, mm -hmm. do you want to take immediate containment actions uh, across the whole of an environment until you've properly scoped uh, the, the incident out? So uh, containment's uh, really going to be down to uh, getting yourself prepared, ready for uh, that, those sort of investigations. And then the remediation component parts come out of the kind of aftermath. Um, you know, how do you make sure that you've identified the root cause to prevent this from problem from happening again? Uh, and then looking at, OK, what do you need to fix uh, as well? You know, that the root cause could have been a firewall uh, being left open uh, or in this, uh, in some cases, it could be uh, vulnerable software hadn't been so, uh, properly patched. So making sure you've got those uh, steps in place and you've, you carry that forward uh, as new uh, systems or new rule changes are applied. Yeah, uh, really, sorry. Uh, and again, uh, the more uh, most important part at that end of any uh, incident is that kind of uh, lessons I, I call lessons identified rather than lessons learned. Um, you may not actually put in you know those lessons identified into action and therefore learned by them. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely uh, one of those points. It's also important to say it's probably a lot of this tends to be a cyclical process. So you, you, you often have to go back to the beginning and keep it's not something you just suddenly uh, uh, complete. Right. It's a continual process. That's right. Yeah. So I should do that scoping uh, and finding like you may put uh, containment measures in place. If your uh, initial scope hasn't been successful enough, you may get another pop up uh, by the, the threat actor uh, or hackers, uh, and therefore you're back into your uh, identification and uh, uh, observation kind of stages, really. Again, well, that's what I was going to ask actually, because it's interesting you kind of touched, we, you spoke quite a bit about remediation and also finding root cause, and then you, you briefly touched on why, if it's particularly an APT or a targeted attack, um, maybe you have to wait sometimes so you have more answers. I mean. What happens if you don't do that? Like when it goes wrong and you just drop the net really fast or you don't find root cause, like what? Why should they do that? What's the impact? Generally, uh, we see with those types of uh, investigations, um, the, the threat actor, if they've been in situ uh, for a period of time, uh, they've got primary, secondary, in some cases, even tertiary uh, communication methods. So if you haven't found out all those kind of points, then you may drop the, the net, as you say, on the, the first two. Uh, however, the threat actor won't just come back through their tertiary comms mechanisms, and then they're still able to uh, enact their action on its objectives. Nice. Thanks. That was a good discussion, actually. Um, and I think that's it. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. On to the next one soon. Mm -hmm.